So I should say, so this is this, what I'm going to talk about today comes from a long paper I've written with Mike Schneider, who's here, and Niels Linneman, who I'm not sure is here because he has another thing something else on, on today. Um, you may hear us hear me set, make some other sort of auto, more, more autobiographical remarks as, we, as I give the paper. Um, but I think it's clear that we're not entirely on the same page on every issue in the vicinity that I'm going to talk about here. So while we have a paper to which we're all willing to sign, um, we at least have different kind of perspectives on what's going on. So although everything, you know, even more than usual, you know, the good things here, I'm willing to, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to share with them or attribute to them. Um, but I do not want to foist them with everything that I say today. Um, I want to kind of make, make that clear. Um, okay. So, I, yes, I'm going to talk about some new uh, um, proposed experiments um, to try to witness, try to observe the effects of quantum gravity in the laboratory. So I'll start, I start the talk with the sort of customary warning that, or, or sort of notice that, you know, people think it's very hard to um, test quantum gravity, to um, test the predictions of quantum gravity, to have a sort of empirical sort of um, access to the theory. So, and that, since that's the topic of the talk, I'll start with the same kind of warning. Um, and of course, this comes down to the fact that it's very hard to probe the Planck scale. So there's the note. Well, there's a couple of really important, um, a number of really important sort of caveats to that. First, um, of course, general relativity and quantum mechanics are the, the limits, the, the classical and uh, low energy limits of uh, quantum gravity. So insofar as we have stories in string theory or loop quantum gravity about how they're recovered, I mean, those are predictions of quantum gravity. Second, I want to, you know, emphasize and uh, endorse the work that David Wallace has done recently on, as he puts it, low energy quantum gravity. So if by quantum gravity, um, Wallace says you include quantum gravity as effective field theory in the quantum field theory sense, um, and that's kind of not what I'm going to mean by quantum gravity here, we would mean in the deeper sense, but if you include that, then it's certainly going to be the case that um, there are, in fact, novel tested predictions. So if, if you accept quantum gravity as effective field theory, you think about that theory, then if you take, if you work in the mean field limit, you're in semi-classical gravity. And there are many phenomena that we need that theory to, or we use that theory to model. And one could think of those as novel predictions. Moreover, and I only recently come to sort of really appreciate this point from David, that in fact, sort of, there is at least one top area where one goes outside even of um, semi-classical mean field um, gravity in uh, quantum gravity as effective field theory. And that is to explain the, what we see in the cosmic microwave background structure. The, the standard explanation of that in terms of um, fluctuations in the inflaton field. In fact, as I understand it, require in this theory, require in this effective field theory approach that you um, indeed treat quantum space-time itself as being in superposition. So things aren't quite as grim as my first warning uh, I might have suggested. Okay, well, there's a new kind of experiment that goes outside of those kinds of regimes and aims to observe somehow the, characteristic, um, the characteristically quantum nature of gravity to sort of see gravity behaving in a quantum manner. Um, so the CMB argument does something like that, um, but we could talk about the, how, I see, how we see the uh, distinction later. I wanna talk about new experiments that really want to establish that, you know, a, a case in which gravity is behaving quantum mechanically. So the first thing you might think of is to go to a, an, a, an the analogy with electromagnetism and how do we see the electromagnet, uh, you know, it, the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field? Well, the sort of standard thing one sort of learns about in high school, of course, is the photoelectric effect. 
and you wonder whether there could be some sort of gravitational version of a photoelectric effect producing gravitons instead of photons. And of course, in principle, there could, but the scales involved make it utterly practic you know, impossible for any practical purposes. So I think this was hydrogen. If you, you, know, you look up for the transition from an, an electron to go from an N equals two to an N equals one state emitting a photon, um, well, the potential involved is, the electrical potential involved is 10 electron volts, but the gravitational potential energy involved is 10 to the minus 38 electron volts. All right, so these are the kind of standard numbers that get thrown at you to show how, how this kind of experiment you know, would be very hard in, uh, in, in the case of gravity. Sort of more promisingly, and this will come up again, is to take a quantum system that's entangled, sort of observably entangled, interact with gravity in a way that produces decoherence so that it's no longer entangled. You have a mixed state for the quantum, the quantum matter state. And then you would have seen sort of indirectly you know, that indeed there must have been a quantum interaction with gravitons so that um, you know, by witnessing uh, the loss of, um, of coherence for the, the matter state, would it be indicative of an interaction with the quantum states of gravity, namely gravitons? So that'll come up again later in the talk, but in again is much easier than a gravitational sort of version of the photoelectric effect, but still a very, very hard experiment way beyond current technology as I understand it. But the topic we're gonna to talk about, or I'm gonna talk about today involves gravcats, gravitational Schrodinger cats. So the idea is you can find a system that's small enough, you can put it in superposition and maintain quantum um, coherence, but it's heavy enough that if I have two of them, they will actually you know, have an observable gravitational interaction and we can observe the effects of that. So it turns out around the Planck masses, it's possible to have both those things. We can just about you know, keep things, hope to keep objects in quantum co coherence, um, but also they will be heavy enough so that you can actually observe gravitational effects. That's kind of more than just a, sort of in principle reason to be excited about this because um, developing technology on experiments involving very small gravitational fields of very small objects and technology involving superposition of, you know, of more and more massive objects are coming closer and closer together by a few orders of magnitude so that um, one can hope that it's plausible that in, in the, another decade or so, within the decade, that kind of time frame, one might actually be able to perform such an experiment. So there's quite a lot of excitement about this in the physics literature at the moment. Okay, so here's the outline. That's sort of an introductory slide. The outline is I really have kind of two goals in this talk. So the first one is I'm assuming mostly philosophers here who have not sort of thought so we come across this or are fairly new to this. And so I want to have a section introducing the physics to the to philosophers. So we'll do a very first, a very quick first pass, um, naively sketching the experiment. We'll, ex I will explain how it um, rules out, in fact, a positive result to the experiment would, would rule out semi-classical gravity. Then we'll have to dig down a bit deeper to understand um, how one might model the situation um, more carefully. And what we'll see, there are actually two competing models, one of which would say there is no quantum, you, you are not witnessing the quantum character of gravity, and one of which would say you are. The second point is to then turn to the, the second goal is to turn to interpretational issues. And so dig into that question that we were looking at, that I mentioned, that I just mentioned. What exactly would the experiment show? Which of these models is the correct one? Would it in fact be a witness, as the lingo goes, to um, the quantum nature of gravity? I don't propose to actually decide that question here. Rather, we're going to look at what people have said and I think try to reconstruct the way people have been thinking about this and set out the arguments that one ha that have been given or could be given one way or the other on the question of what does actually the experiments achieve, whether they do show reveal quantum gravity. And in fact, if there's a philosophical point, it's going to be more along the lines of this issue cannot be decided conceptually. 
Um, there is just a certain level of theory ladenness here, and that's all one can say. That'll actually be the philosophical conclusion. And then I'm gonna, if there's time, um, I will spend a little bit of time talking a bit more about um, what's the value about the, in broader terms, about the value of the experiment. So since that took 10 minutes, I suspect we'll get to that. Okay, so let's start with um, a naive account of, of the experiment. Um, I'll call it the GravCat experiment. Sometimes people call it the BMV experiment of, after some of the people who proposed it. Um, but that leaves some of the names out, so it's perhaps not, a, not the best name. So but we'll talk about GravCats um, here. So I'm going to first give a very simple-minded analysis. And so that's just to explain the setup and the expectations. And but you'll see, we'll really need to think this through in a more kind of rigorous way about what's actually going on. But I just want to kind of get a, a, the simplest way of thinking about this on the table so you can see what one would, um, you know, how the expectations go. So one envisions um, an experiment with two grab cats, as I've described them. And in one of the original papers, they suggested these might be really small um, pieces of diamond, for instance. And we're going to put them into the, the experiment envisions, putting them into a superposition. Each of, we have two grab cats. Each one is in a superposition. And initially, of course, in a separable state. So does that you see my cursor OK? Yep, OK. So a little bit on the sort of notation. So I've got two grav cats. Here's grav cat one over here. And it's in a super, it's expected position is at minus D. But one, one component of the superposition is in the left, is to the left of that by, by delta. One component is to the right of it by delta. And similarly, there's another grav cat over here at position, whose expected position is plus D. So the L over, so the notation here is, I'll use the position, you know, with the position in the tensor product to indicate whether it's the first grab cat or the second grab cat. So on the left of the tensor product, um, I will put the, the grab cat one state, on the right of the grab cat two state. So over here, I have the grab cat one in a superposition of um, the left position and the right position, and grab cat two in a superposition of the left position and the right position. We can multiply that out. Of course, it still factorizes, it's still separable. I have a sum of terms, the first one, which represents, for instance, the first grab cat, grab cat one in the left position, and grab cat two in the right position. Here again, it's grab cat one in the left position, grab cat two in the right position. So I haven't put little subscripts for one and two on the states, just to keep the notation clean. So you just remember one is on the left, two is, two is on the right. Okay. So now we look at these four terms. So each one of these represents a, a, a classical state where there's a different distance between the two grab cats. For instance, if they're both um, if in the first term, the left left term, they're a distance 2D apart. Okay. However, in the left right term, they're the furthest apart. I've got going from left for grab cat one to right to grab cat two, that distance is 2D plus two delta. Whereas in the right left term, so this one to here, the distance is 2D minus two delta. So they're all different distances apart. We're just gonna think in terms of Newtonian potentials. So there's a different potential associated with each term. And so we're going to get, um, these are gonna be um, produce different um, phases if I leave the system sitting in this state for a, for a, a time t. Okay, right. The uh, the numerator is the same in each case, but the denominator is different because it depends on the uh, the distance between the, the the two grab cats corresponding to each state. Okay, so one leaves that long enough until the phase differences get large enough to be observed, and then one does a bell type experiment to observe the, the entanglement between uh, the two systems. Okay, so that's the, the basic idea that we have here. So here's the claim that's then made in the literature that if one observes this gravitationally induced entanglement, GIE, I'll abbreviate it. So sometimes these are called the GIE experiments. 
The claim is that this would be a witness, in some sense, an indirect observation of the quantum nature of gravity. And so the, the, there are sort of three core papers that um, uh, make this claim. So the first one is by um, Berzer and his, and his group or, and, and a group of other co-authors from 2017. Um, si simultaneously, Marletto and Vedral, also from 2017, um, coming from a different point of view, proposed this kind of experiment to witness gravity, uh, quantum nature of gravity. And then there's a uh, another paper from a couple of years later um, that's also an important claim here um, that I will sort of mention again later by Crystal Adulu and um, Ravelli. Okay, so that's the claim we want to sort of unpack here. And I think the first thing that you would think after I've just made this claim, and I think Jeremy made this to me, first thing after he read the abstract to the talk, so my, my, uh, I've read about this, it seems the obvious thing to say is, where's the quantum nature of gravity in any of this? Because this whole argument just turned on thinking about a classical potential, you know, a seemingly classical potential between the grab cats, it's just different in each case. Well, it does have hats. So it's, you know, I mean, this is quantum mechanics, so it has to be an operator. But still, how do we get to something sort of quantum in this case? So in a sense, that's that's the question that we're going to sort of unpack as we as we go. Okay. However, first thing I want to say is put that question to one side, even if you don't worry about that. It's really important to notice that this experiment, however you interpret it, is going to bear on, on semi-classical gravity. Um, 20 plus years ago, Craig Callender and I wrote a paper about the, um, the sort of apri well, the sort of purely theoretical thought experiment arguments against um, the idea that semi-classical gravity uh, could be fundamental. Oh, excuse me. Ugh touch the screen. Um, and we sort of argued there needed to be experimental evidence at that point. Um, we downplayed the, um, the famous um, Page and Galka experiments there, and maybe I don't have quite the same view of those these days, but still, this experiment, however, regardless of the question of witnessing, um, would be a refutation of uh, semi-classical gravity as sort of a fundamental theory. So by semi-classical gravity, one just I just mean you know, the Einstein-Müller-Rosen equation. Take the Einstein equation and replace the classical stress-energy tensor with the expectation value of the quantum stress-energy um, tensor for the um, state of the matter field. And that's the basic idea of uh, semi-classical gravity, and we can see very quickly that that's simply going to pre pre predict um, a that there won't be any entanglement between the grav cats. So we're in the Newtonian limit. So the expected stress energy in this case is, just means the um, expected positions of the grab cats. So the expected position of grab cat one is at minus D, the expected position of grab cat two. So I say that you know, the expected stress energy tensor is that corresponding to a mass at you know, a single mass at minus d and a single mass at, at, at plus d and then one would then sort of model the system as saying well grab cat one that the left and right components of grab cat one are sitting in a potential due to a grab cat sitting at plus at position plus d and grab cat two consists of a left put a left component and a right component sitting in a potential um, due to a mass sitting at minus d. So I've written that in now, in, in here. So that gives me for the left component of grab cat one, a potential you know, that is responding to a mass that's 2d plus delta away um, and so on. I've color coded them here. So red goes with the left component of one, green with the right component of one and, and so on, okay. And now if you do the same calculus, you know, you just write things out the same way as I did before, you start with the same initial state, you add, you insert the potentials this time. Well, of course, what you find is the left component um, of grab cat one gets the same position now in both terms of this superposition. Same for all of them. Each of the components um, gets the same potential. And that means this will not destroy the factorization. 
Okay, so it's absolutely crucial um, as soon as we kill the superposition of the source, so that we just have a grab cat at minus d and a grab cat at plus d, you no longer will see any, you no longer predict any interference. You still have a, a separable state. And so semi classical gravity simply does not predict entanglement. And so if one um, observes <coughs> gravitationally induced entanglement in such an experiment, at very least, you know, semi-classical gravity does not apply to this case. I don't get the right experiment. So that's one sense in which you might say that I've witnessed the quantum nature of gravity. I've witnessed that it's not semi-classical in the sense of semi-classical gravity. But that seems like a pretty thin sense. And certainly people are claiming more than that. And so I want to unpack more than that. Also, Although this experiment is becoming feasible, it is going to be hard and expensive and many people are gonna to have to be involved and it's going to be a lot of work. So there is kind of a question and I would say, sort of, no, is it worth doing experiments simply to rule out semi-classical gravity? So that's something I hope to come back to at the end. Um, I would say no, but I would say there are lots of other, you know, there are other compelling reasons to perform the, the experiment. Okay, so that's good. But we have to go back to our original question. Is there some deeper sense in which we witness the quantum nature of gravity here? Okay, so I think the initial slide I, I called it the naive model, where we just sort of postulate a potential. I now want to talk about a little more theory, think through more carefully from a sort of theoretical point of view and from more fundamental physics, where that potential might actually um, be coming from. Okay, so this is now, I'm gonna re refer to a derivation that was done actually back in 14, thinking about grav cats, but you know, earlier than the 17 papers, not claiming that there's going to be a witness for quantum, quantum nature of gravity. Uh, and indeed these authors are skeptical of that claim. Um, but this derivation is very relevant to what we're doing. The A and H here is Anastopoulos and who? So I should also note, and I'll do it now in case I forget to do it later, Mike pointed out to me um, last, just last night, so I haven't had a chance to read it or whatever. I had a chance, but didn't take it because I was thinking about what I already had to say. Um, they have a paper out in the last week uh, actually giving arguments, I think, against what I'm going to say later. So. Maybe we'll come back to that. So if people have looked at that paper. I'm afraid I haven't looked at it. But Mike wasn't preparing for a talk, so maybe he's looked at it and he will, he will answer the questions. Okay, so how, let's try to put some more kind of theoretical flesh on this, um, on the naive model. So how would one go about modeling it? Well, we think we're gonna start with GR and in particular with the action for GR. And you know it's just a just simple body, so we'll start with a scalar field. We do standard approach. Going to linearize the theory in Minkowski spacetime, so we're going to be looking for theory of fluctuations of gravitational waves around Minkowski spacetime. It's a gauge theory, so we have to gauge fix. And again, I'll refer you to the paper, but you would come up if you follow that standard process, you'll come up with the following Hamiltonian. So there's a Hamiltonian for the, um, the Klein-Gordon field for the scalar for scalar matter. There is this um, Newtonian potential term, which is sourced by epsilon, which is the matter density. So that's going to be the, that's going to be the potential. That's the Newtonian part. And then we're going to get terms um, involving an interaction between uh, the stress energy T and metric perturbations, gravitational waves gamma. And then we'll get a Hamiltonian term corresponding to self interactions between, the, gravi between the, the gravitational perturbations. And I put in dots to indicate, well, I said I linearized, if you went beyond linear, you would have higher order terms to put into this as, as well. Okay. Now, in the calculation that's relevant to the gravitationally induced interact, um, in, um, uh, entanglement, we need to take the Newtonian limit here. So we'll take a static Newtonian limit. 
it's static, so we will um, the 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 energy of the, the Klein Gordon energy, there's no kinetic energy. We don't care about any other interaction between the grab cats. We don't care about their kinetic energy. So that term drops out. In the Newtonian limits, the perturbations drop out. We don't care about actually about the metric fluctuations. And so those terms are going to drop out. Everything drops out. All that's left is this potential term. And so when we quantize, we're just going to be left with a Hamiltonian that is the exactly the potential that we started before, um, GM squared over the you know, difference in expected uh, in positions. So this is the sort of theoretical way that one would arrive at the potential that we just um, helped ourselves to in the naive model. And so this has the same potential as the naive model, but in the way we talk about it, the Newtonian model means that potential understood in this, in this theoretical context. Of course, the potential is the same, so the prediction is going to be the same. Okay, a couple of sort of observations from a gauge theoretic point of view then that one would make about this. So this is this Newtonian term, this Newtonian potential in the analysis, in the gauge fixing analysis, this is a term that comes from the gauge constraint that's imposed. And of course, it's fully determined by the instantaneous matter distribution. It's not part of the dynamical part of the theory. That's in the, the graviton gamma part of the theory. So, and I'll come back to this point. One would say from a gauge theoretic point of view, the true, I'm putting quotations around here that I'm using that in the technical gauge theoretic sense, the true degrees of freedom, so-called true degrees of freedom, all lie in the metric perturbations in, in the gravi in gravitons. And so none of those are playing a role in the um, predicted effect in the calculation of the, um, e the expected um, uh, phase shifts that we see, the expected entanglement quantitatively. Okay, so in that sense, and this is a sense that it has been pushed by Anastopoulos and who, if we witness gravitationally induced entanglement, it doesn't witness the quantum nature of gravity at all. One might say, right, the quantum, quantum nature of gravity means seeing the quantized nature of the dynamical parts of the theory, the true degrees of freedom. Not only one might say that, that has been said. All right. But I'm sure a number of you are sort of thinking, okay, that gets us to that point, but hasn't. But there's another side to this, rather obviously. For the last 200 years, we've come to realize that interactions are mediated by fields, and 100 years ago, we, this came to be seen in general relativity. That that's how we should really be understanding gravity properly as a dynamical field, not as a sort of just given Newtonian potential. We need to sort of actually understand how it's a field, and now we know how to do that. Um, and gravity is dynamic, <coughs> okay. it's causal, and somehow that has just dropped out of the model that I just presented, the Newtonian model. We don't that didn't kind of that didn't that isn't there. So there's something rock fishy about that model, and we ought to somehow put this back in again. I mean, it's true that the Newtonian model starts with, you know, learning that lesson, but the derivation makes it disappear in, in some way. Okay, well, we just proceed in a pretty naive kind of way, simple minded way here. What we just did was wrong. Let, let's start again from a different point of view and consciously, you know, explicitly represent this fact that, you know, that there's an interaction here being mediated by, a, by, a, by a, a, a subsystem. And if you think about it that way, I really wrote things down wrong in the first place. I just went wrong at the very beginning to say there were only two things involved, two subsystems involved, the two grab cats, because really there's a third one as well, namely the gravitational field. And so I should really be writing states like this as tripartite. So the first one represents, you know, grab cat one being in its left position, and grab cat two being in its left position. And then there's a third between them subsystem representing the gravitational field appropriate to a grab cat on the left and a grab cat on the right. Over here, you know, I have a system representing grab cat on the left, grab cat on the right, 
and the gravitational field appropriate for that. Okay, so these gamma states, you know, what should these gamma states be? Well, you know, a very natural thought is that they should be definite states of metric geometry associated with each GravCat pair. They're not just going to be a potential because they're, they're states. What are their states of something? They're states of the gravitational field. So what do these, what do these gammas represent? Well, a, a very natural thought is that they just represent the different geometries corresponding to the different configurations of grab cats, you know, both in their left state, one on their left, one on their right, um, one on the right, you know, the other on the left, and, and so on. Okay, again, we're still in the new static Newtonian regime, and then the appropriate potential is the one that I've given here. Um, and so we just have, you know, this, this is from general relativity, this is the right metric to get the Newtonian potential sort of outside the body, and then we will set that when well, one sets the potential inside the grav cat um, to to be a constant okay so that's the natural thing to do here and that's exactly what um crystal Ladulu and ravelli did in their 19 paper um but where this this is exactly the idea that they have here and exactly the um, geometry that they propose for each for the state in each term and then you can think, okay, but now I have pairs of grav cats, they're sitting in different geometries, and so they're going to be uh, experiencing uh, between, uh, from between the beginning and the end of the experiment, they're going to be experiencing different proper time. There's going to be a redshift effect. Some of them are going to take more time and less time. They're all, they all have mass energy, so they all have a phase that ticks in that sense at a constant rate. But relative, but according to proper time. So I'm going to be, I have little clocks so I can measure each of them is going to measure how much proper time they have. And those different measurements are going to be the phases. And then I'm going to be able to compare them in just the same way. It's going to produce a relative phase that's going to produce entanglement. And as they, as, as um, Crystal Adula and Ravelli show, you're going to, from that way of thinking, you're going to get exactly the same relative phases that you did from the Newtonian and, and naive model. Okay, so from this model, right, thinking this way, it seems like gravitationally induced entanglement does give a witness to the quantum superposition of gravity. The effect that I'm witnessing, this entanglement that I put down to a relative phase, is entirely due to a superposition of geometries and the different terms in the superposition experiencing different proper times. And so According to this model, gravitationally induced entanglement does witness uh, a quantum superposition of gravity. A little note to plug our own paper, um, but Mike, Mike especially on this. I just wanted, it's worth noting, you know, we motivated this kind of approach at the beginning of the slide um, you know, in a natural way by thinking, oh, gravity is causal. So we really need to respect that in our model. Um, but actually, causality in the relativistic sense isn't essential to this argument. If you think about, might work this out in for Newton-Cartan Newton gravity as well, you would get exactly the same kind of result. Um, indeed, you know, it's also the original paper from seventeen, or one of the a pair of original papers, the Berzer um, collaborators' paper, um, basically does the, has the same model. Um, but instead of using superpositions of gravity, they're thinking in terms of states that are coherent states of the graviton field. Of course, have quantum superpositions as well. Okay. So what really matters to get this kind of line of thought off the ground? So I, I, I set this up in a simple-minded way in a pretty specific um, model. Um, the point I'm making now is one can certainly generalize and so to Newton-Cartan or in thinking about a quantum in quantum field terms. People have sort of generalized even more. So what actually matters for this con concluding or arguing in this way that gravitationally induced inter um, entanglement witnesses you know, the quantum nature of gravity um, is that in the appropriate sense, gravity be an interaction mediating system. So one thing you could do is actually basically as soon as you've written things down in the way I have and you've simply you start working in quantum mechanics and you assume the tripartite 
system. If you try to assume that this third system, this gamma system is classical, which basically means it only has, it doesn't have any non-commuting observables really in quantum mechanics. The only way you can represent something is classical by saying it basically only has commuting observables. So basically one up to whatever is up to rescaling then you will not be able to get entanglement out. It's pretty straightforward, just fact about uh, quantum mechanics. Sorry, I should say, as long as the two grav cats are not interacting in any other way, if all that can happen is grav cat one interacts with this second, this third system, and grav cat two interacts with this third system, and this third system is classical in the sense of having um, no non-commuting observables, then you won't get any entanglement. That's a pretty basic fact about quantum mechanics. Um, yeah. It's also a kind of an effect that nothing will actually change about the third classical system. There's going to be a super selection rule. So it's actually, in some sense, not very natural at all to try to represent classical systems in the, this sort of Hilbert space quantum framework. So for that reason, there have been various attempts to kind of generalize this result, that if a system is an, in, if an interaction is mediated by a third system, purely by a third system, relax the assumptions of quantum mechanics. One way to do that is constructor theory, David Deutsch and Maletto's constructor theory, and Maletto and Vedral um, have had a paper, uh, this 20 paper arguing that, um, and then, I've forgotten who the GG and S is here. So another way, but another line of thought, oh, well, one of them is Giacomini, <laughs> and I've forgotten who the other G and the S is, I'm afraid. But another thought is to use another kind of way of generalizing quantum mechanics, generalized probability theory. And then you can actually prove more general theorems along this line, that if in, you find entanglement at the end of a, if you have two systems that become entangled, and they don't interact directly, only through a third subsystem, then that third sus subsystem in the appropriate sense cannot be classical. All right, so the different kind of ways of proving those theorems then have different assumptions about what it is to be an interaction mediating subsystem and sort of obviously various assumptions, but they're pretty general, pretty weak. So as soon as you assume those and you are thinking, you know, and that's how you decide to model um, this system, then um, you're pretty much stuck with, uh, well, you are stuck. It is just gonna be a theorem that the system is at least not, not classical. Uh, ask me that later, Enrique. Okay, so that's the physics. I think we kind of sort of have the models on the table now. So <clears throat> two models. Both seem to be well motivated by sort of physical principles. One starts with quantum, you know, with general relativity, Lagrangian general relativity, gauge theory leads to the Newtonian model, in which, in which case it doesn't seem like we have a description, there's no quantumness of interest in quantumness of gravity in that description. Perfectly reasonable as well to start with the idea that gravity, you know, is a, is a causal dynamical system and should be represented as a third <clears throat> interacting mediator in the system. And then we do get the conclusion that gravity is, uh, that we're gonna witness that entanglement witnesses the quantum nature of gra gravity in the sense that without the, a quantum super, you know, without a non-classical state of gravity, we just won't get this entanglement that we see. So well, well, what, what should we uh, think about that? Okay, so sorry, I should have said that this is what I should have said while I was saying that. So there's the Newtonian model, just to remind you how that looks, um, which says we don't win this quantum gravity since only the gauge fixed term plays a role. In the tripartite model, um, entanglement uh, does witness quantum gravity. So because the gravity, the, the Gravity is a third subsystem and it has to be quantum to actually produce the effect. <coughs> so the natural way, you know, is to ask, you know, actual question to ask, which is the right way to model the experiment and you know, thereby ask whether or not entanglement um, actually would be a witness. Well, 
I want to suggest that that's maybe a bad question, since it assumes that there, you know, we're, we're thinking in both cases that there's some more fundamental physics here. And, and what we're trying to do is idealize in some ways, everyone's taking the, a Newtonian limit, we need to idealize to model some particular system in some particular you know, regime where those idealizations are appropriate. And maybe what we're just sort of seeing here is what's the same underlying physics, it's yielding different empirically equivalent models. And in that case, are these just sort of perhaps equal alternatives? You know, there is just a matter of theoretical perspective here. Okay, indeed, neither of these starts from, you know, as I've kind of been emphasizing, they all start from perfectly reasonable seeming theoretical stances. No one's suggesting kind of weird physics or weird sort of principles here. Um, but somehow the different starting points, different stances, different assumptions made in building the model um, lead you to rather different places about what's actually happening in the experiment. So what I want to kind of suggest is that the, the matter is um, actually theory laden. Okay. So in other words, you know, I, I want to, I guess two goals, and now I'm kind of coming to the major sort of philosophical um, aims of the, of the paper. One is to kind of reconstruct even more carefully the different kinds of assumptions that are going on here. And maybe not just assumptions, you know, just, do have sort of Kuhnian themes in the back of my mind. You know, there are maybe sort of just different theoretical values here um, about what's the right, what are good things to do, what's the right way, what are the right choices to make when idealizing. So there's a certain amount of unpacking of those kinds of assumptions that we've done, um, sort of going through papers, talking to people to kind of try to understand the different perspectives. And then, of course, part of that is to sort of see if there's some common ground on which both can stand to actually adjudicate the issue. But we have not found it. And I guess the, the kind of conclusion we're pointing to is there is no, there is ultimately no kind of fixed point from which you can decide which is the right way to model. Um, and, you know, it's in my nature to like the part of Kuhn that says reasonable people can disagree. And that's kind of how I think that's more. Okay. All right. So those are the kind of goals. And now I'm kind of getting to the sort of philosophical heart of what we've done. So we'll take the models in turn and, and think through what they what we can say in terms of each of them. So the Newtonian model. So there is one thing, one line of thought that goes with the new, that's in support of the Newtonian model that we actually, that, that we actually do want to, to reject. So one line of thought, so certainly the Newtonian model um, applies the standard techniques of gauge quantization. There's also a certain line that implies the in, interpretational law of gauge theory to GR. So, it reasons like this, look, the so-called true degrees of freedom do not play a role. In the technical sense, um, we completely agree with that, but rather the whole effect is due to a Newtonian potential. There's a kind of line of thought that though that goes from this basically formal point, it's just a definition of what the true degrees and gate, you know, a true degree of freedom is versus the gauge fixed part of the theory, and that's not unproblematic. But there's a further step of drawing interpretational conclusions. And that means accepting not just this formal point, but a set of interpretational assumptions about the mathematical facts, namely something along the lines of the idea that the gauge fixed part is conventional, unphysical fluff while all the physical real stuff is in the tree, true degrees of freedom. And that's what we don't, we would, we would reject. Is that, the, is that interpretational part, gloss that's put onto this mathematical fact um, correct? So just think about what it is to be a true degree of freedom and is that all there is to gravity? Well, we say no, it can't be, and, and there's, two or three reasons for saying that. First of all, what ends up as gauged 
And what ends up as, um, a, as a true degree of freedom is partly dependent on the cho choice of gauge. So what's real, what's not real can't be dependent on a, on, a, on a gauge choice. Of course, it's also the case that different potentials, even if they are you know, gauge constraint, even if they are fixed by matter, correspond to real different sit gravitational situations. So that there is real physics in the potential, even when understood as um, coming from the gauge constraint. And of course, this is all the reason that we thought, you know, before GR, all we had was the Newtonian potential, and that was gravity. It would be kind of crazy to go back and say, actually, nobody knew what gravity was at all. There was no physics in Newtonian Newton's theory. Of course, that's not right. So it's too strong to say that just because um, the Newtonian potential is, uh, comes from a gauge constraint, it's not a true degree of freedom, that there's no physics, there's no gravitational physics at all involved in the um, GravCat experiments. That would be, that would be uh, wrong. Okay, well, I've said it's ont ontologically tendentious. I've just said something rather sort of stronger than that. To try to go from saying there's no two true degrees of freedom involved, to saying there's no, this isn't probing gravity, is just an equivocation on the word true, I would say here. Um, I will also just briefly note, just to be careful here, it's quite correct that calculating the um, relative phases doesn't require the, gra the graviton degrees of freedom. But in the actually performing the experiment, they would be involved as well. You wouldn't have to calculate them. But when you have the grab cats being put into superposition in the first place and then recombined so we can see their entanglement, then, th then we are outside the static situation. Things are moving around and we are going to have interactions. There are going to be the interactions with gravitons are going to be part of the physics. Okay, but they're not part of the predict the quantitative prediction is what I want to say. Okay. So we've rejected one way of one kind of argument that would come in support of the Newtonian model. But it still seems we haven't really addressed that initial challenge. All we've got is this potential. We've put the, the hat on it. It's still true that it's gauge, it's not dynamical. If that's the great, you know, if that's the way in which gravity is making itself felt, is um, being in the experiment, how is that to manifest the quantum nature of gravity? In some ways, what does that hat, what are those hats really? kind of give us here. Okay, now from the tripartite point of view. So again, the central idea here is that gravity is some kind of intermediary um, subsystem. And we motivated that with space-time causality. Though, as I kind of noted, all we really need is the, whatever that means in terms of the weaker assumptions of the general theorems about uh, entanglement and classical subsystems. How might somebody, but let's just think about whether somebody could be pressed into holding this view. Well, here's some ways one might resist actually accepting that, those, that premise, that gravity is an intermediary subsystem in the relevant way. Well, one might be um, sort of neutral on the question of whether the EFT approach to GR is valid. So that one wasn't really willing to write down the system as a superposition of three of three quantum subsystems. So, you know, much as Wallace um, is arguing that you know, the EFT approach to GR has novel predictions, <clears throat> he, his work does indeed point out that outside the semi-classical regime, there's precious little evidence for that, or that, or it's been. In, it has not been um, tested except for the CMB data outside the semi classical regime. So, you know, one might just be a kind of cautious physicist who doesn't want to kind of commit too soon to some particular theoretical theory. Um, to, sorry, just to some theory. Um, then I'll, another point I wanted to attribute to Mike one might especially think if one was not a theorist, but an experimentalist. 
working in these fields, one might not feel very strongly that one ought to take a theoretical stance on, you know, on how to marry quantum mechanics with gravity. And one might just feel, you know, one might distribute one's credences in a way that made one pretty neutral to whether that's actually the right way to, um, to the tripartite model is actually the right way to model things. Okay, there's a stronger view one might take and you sort of see this sometimes you might take some, what would amount to a pretty unorthodox approach to quantum gravity and think something rather different um, is going on in quantum gravity than, uh, that would then that would lead you to an EFT approach to GR or whatever the premise or to the assumptions of the, the various theorems. There are such views sort of on the table that try to keep gravity um, classical. Um, I'm not exactly sure, you know, to Penrose and BOC have kind of proposed things along these lines, although I'm not I, I'm not clear enough on what they would say about this experiment to see whether they would resist the, you know, the tripartite model in this case. For Penrose, at least, it seems not impossible if, for gravity to sometimes be in a small superposition. It just can't get too big, so it's not quite clear. Okay, so people might resist um, the assumption, but I think it's really important, especially for sort of understanding the debate that goes on, that amongst theorists of quantum gravity, I think the idea that one can take a meaning sensibly take an EFT approach to quant to GR. Um, is widely accepted, but that's a pretty common common view. And the idea that sort of any of the ideas we've been talking about here would be sort of inapplicable um, is, 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 is not a, it's not widely accepted. So one of course can go even weaker than that, as I've noted. I don't have to actually um, uh, go as far as saying, yeah, I think you know an effective field theory approach to GR, gives me a quantum the low energy quantum theory of gravity. I could go even weaker than that and say, yeah, I mean, I think the weaker assumptions of the no-go theorems are true of gravity. Okay. And even then, if entanglement, if gravitationally induced entanglement is observed, then a space-time superposition does mean that there was a, a non-classical state. Nevertheless, and I will stop after I finish this slide. Even if you were that person, you were the kind of person who said, yeah, yeah, you know, I believe in string theory, I believe in loop quantum gravity, I think as a low energy limit, I'm going to get GR an effective field theory, I'm going to approach to GR, I can apply quantum, quantum mechanics in the normal way to GR. So yeah, no, I totally grant that what's really going on here, or what's more fundamentally going on here, is that I've got a quantum state of gravity, it seems to me one might still hold that the tripartite model is not the right way to model the system. The Newtonian model is the right one. Okay, that's given the actual regime that I'm acting, that I'm in, given the actual physics of the grav cats. It's wrong to appeal to that background theory by to EFT and G, uh, approach to GR and to the quantum nature of gravity, uh, to, to um, gravity as, a, as a, third a third quantum subsystem, that's not the right way to do it because I am in a particular you know, limit of the theory. And so I have to, what goes into deciding the right way to model it, there are questions here about what are the right idealizations? What are the appropriate idealizations I should make? And I might think that the Newtonian model is actually the right way to model it, that the idealizations that are appropriate um, Regardless of my background beliefs, um, my theoretical commitments, the assumptions of the Newtonian models are actually the one, the right way to idealize in the situation. And in that case, I would think, although I thought really or fundamentally, there was a, I was, this was a witness for quantum gravity in the most relevant sense, which comes from what's the right way, given that I'm idealizing to describe the situation in front of me, this is not a witness, not as in the strongest sense that I want. And three more sort of comments about that. So I might have a kind of maxim, and I made this up so I don't voice this on mic in any way. I might say, look, if I have models that are, you know, models that are empirically equivalent, then I should prefer those that, you know, idealize them more, that 
build in as build, idealize more. That sounds a little weird, but what I'm saying is keep things simple. Build in as little as the fundamental physics as you as you as you as you can. Keep things as simple in that sense as possible. Mike will be happier with this one. I can also, but I can again still still appeal to this reason. Look, it, gravity is a gauge constraint. You know, I actually believe in GR. You know, I believe really because of the no-go theorems that there's a superposition here. But as a matter of fact, gravity is coming from a gauge constraint. And so I shouldn't go mad treating it as a dynamical system and treating it as if it was, if it was dynamical. And also going to point something I, I mentioned again. It's also relevant perhaps that one can indeed point concretely to what a stronger witnessing experiment one would um, could be, namely one that involves entanglement with gravitons. For instance, as I mentioned right at the beginning, a, co a, 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 a coherence destroying um, interaction between a, a material superposition, material superposition or superposition of a material system with the gravitational field. So that it becomes entangled when I trace over the gravitational field. I only, I no longer have an entangled material system. And that's the kind of experiment. Um, this is not quite the way they're putting it up, but if you think about, there's a paper by Belenkia and a, a group of co-authors. Um, if you were actually performing the experiment they were think they were uh, proposing, you would in a way wit if, a witness the, the quantum nature of gravity by seeing the destruction of uh, in, uh, in tang interference um, in a material system. Let's start from Henrique. Hi Nick, thanks again for that really nice talk. I think I'm, I'm just confused about a, a very simple thing and it's probably on me. Um, in, in the Newtonian case, it, you said you separated it into a, a fixed background which was Minkowski and perturbations. Um, but then I'm a little bit confused about how you interpret the resulting potential as, as geometrical in origin, because it seemed to me that you had fixed the geometry to be flat and non-responsive to matter. And uh, so this is, this is one question. Um, the other, question is about the constraint or gauge and I don't really see a problem with that part because um, there are just different ways of satisfying a constraint uh, but I, I see where you went and, and sorry so this is not fundamental the second question and uh, and the third question was the one that I posed how do the analogous treatments in terms of uh, just let's say electrostatics uh, work here, because for example, the electric you you, you said that the, the theory needs to have the, this uh, intervening or the, this gamma field needs to have some non-commuting um, non-commuting non <laughs> operators, and for instance, for the electric electrostatic fields, they are non-commuting only if they're causally related uh, on points that are causally related. So anyways, uh, uh, just focus on these two questions. Uh, forget about the constraint question. Just the question about how do I understand the, the, the distinction that you had made between yeah. a fixed okay. background and, and yeah, and this last one. So I pulled, up the, I pulled up the Newtonian model. This is what you're talking about, this, this step here, right? Yeah, but I... But I don't. I'm not saying that this is ge geometric at all. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure what I said that made. The, the, the yeah, later on. Say that. I mean, so this. This. You know. So the point you've got to here, right, is you have a Minkowski background, <clears throat> and then you have, you know, your Klein-Gordon field, and you have this graviton, whatever the gamma field before you quantize, um, and then you have a matter density. To, you know, and you have a matter density in it. And that's just the Hamiltonian for that system in Minkowski space-time. So I would say what's happened in the gauge fixing is that it's not geometric, you know, it's, it's not geometric. And that, of course, we come back to the sort of 
you know, in a sense, and in a, in, a, in a sense, when you go to the um, tripartite model, <clears throat> that's the point at which you're saying, wow, we lost that it was geometric or we lost that it was dynamic. And that's something we have to put in. But geometric's not quite right because the tripartite model, as I said, works from a sort of quantum field theory perspective, where again, you're taking there to be a fixed background and you're just building coherent states of gravitons. Is that okay? So I think we're on the same page. And if I said something that kind of sounded otherwise, this is just the, you know, this is just the Hamiltonian. And when you enter the static Newtonian regime, all that's left is exactly the potential that you had, that you had before, and it's just a potential. Okay. And, so, and the, yeah, and the comparison with electrostatics for the, for this second type of model where you replace. Yeah. So let me, so the electrostatics, you know, that was one of the ways I tried to sort of shorten the, this talk from previous versions that went too long was by cutting some of the discussion of electrostatics out. Um, in fact, yeah, no, I think, I think that most people think and yeah, electromag or electromagnetism and gravity, everything that was said here goes through just the same in both cases. And not, not just that thing, but kind of everything. So I could do the same, I could have set up the same kind of, you know, uh, analysis here. I don't, you know, I could say it had to be tripartite so that there was an interaction with the electromagnetic field. I could go Newtonian and just put in an electrostatic potential. All that can sort of be done. And so, you know, uh, and uh, the one thing I did say was, um, you know, we could have a, you know, there's a photoelectric effect. We could have an analogous gravitational effect. Um, one could, right, then think about, case, you know, so the question is, what about cases where I have two charges and how, whether they can become entangled uh, through, uh, you know, an electrostatic interaction. So, yeah, those, those general theorems, and I don't, I've, I've looked kind of, I've worked fairly carefully through the paper where um, Marletto and I can't remember who's the co-author on that. Anyway, apply the constructor theory, the David um, Deutsch approach to this. Um, and yeah, there's nothing specific to gravity there at all. It's, it's sort of entirely general. Ah, right, so okay, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it does apply to that case as well. I remember, it, you can reply to that, but I remember that now that there was something more specific you were asking there as well. Should I reply to the thing I just remembered? Yeah, okay. So you were asking what I meant about there being no non-commuting observables. So you were taught, I wasn't saying, I was thinking about four of the subsystem. So I've got a subsystem and the question is what observables are there for that subsystem? So for instance, if I have a, you know, th this stuff, this stuff comes from quantum information theory. So I'm usually thinking about bits and qubits. So basically what I'm saying is it's a bit. All I've got is I don't have sort of spin in different directions. I just get to pick spin in one direction and it's, it's either up okay. or down. That's what makes it classical. It's, it's in that sense that there's. Okay, sorry. I, I had understood that this mediating field had to have, uh, had to be non-commuting. Yeah, in a certain sense. I'm not representing the field with an operator. I'm representing it with a, you know, the state in the, in the, in the state space. Thanks. Jeden. Oh, th thank you so much, Antonio. Thank you, Nick, for a wonderful talk. Uh, really helpful to me. Um, many things to ask about. Let me, let me try and ask a very um, broad philosophy type question, more discussable. And with my usual tendency for the bad jokes, uh, it's, I think, this part of the trouble is this word witness. Hmm. It, because in, it tends, as a, as a you know, go-ahead announcement by the advocate, to mean what you might call signature, meaning unique sign of, and not compatible with, with anything other than what it is the witness of. 
like the word smoking gun, suggests mm -hmm. conclusive evidence of the item in question. But you see, I feel that when we learn that Christodoulou and Ravelli get back the Newtonian relative phases based on this long proper time calculation, then the, the slide concluded, well, in that sense, gravitationally induced entanglement does give a witness to a quantum superposition of gravity. Well, um, the thing is, it's been a deduction uh, that you get these phases, the, that you get this entanglement. But the very fact that the very same phases came from the naive model, which was condemned as not really the real McCoy, shows that witness here means less than smoking gun, right? And that's why you ended up by talking about empirical equivalence, because there, there is actually different models all leading down to the glorious naive model relative phases, right? So I felt it was under determination. And, and, and in that way, find, well, to put an edge to the question, it seemed, it seemed the correct way to model the experiment. Absolutely loved what you were saying in the interpretation section, of course, but I think correct way to model is of course a bit ambiguous between hey, brother, I've got the real good theory. It's just a matter of what's the intelligent or practical or well-judged way to introduce idealizations and approximations to actually link to this hunk of experiment with all its messiness. And the other sense of correct way to model is, oh, I don't know the right fundamental theory. What is my best guess for the underlying theory, right? Of course, I sort of believe that, you know, gravity is a non-commuting, intermediating whatnot, uh, is what I actually believe based on other stuff. Anyway, sorry, that's my question. Witness, is, witness is, a, is a bit of a weasel word in this debate, that seems to me. Yes. So that's great. Um, so this is one of the points where I'm going to go a bit autobiographical because this is kind of the third sort of public outing for this talk or paper. <clears throat> so one time, the first time I gave it, people were, the audience was gung-ho that no way is this, this is clearly not witnessing, this is purely just a classical gravitational effect. The second time was, no, no, this is, that's crazy talk. This is clearly, absolutely, a, um, a, a quantum nature, you know, gravity is manifestly quantum in this case, it's really being witnessed. I mean, to be fair, the main person in that audience was Carlo Rovelli, so that's not, not you know, so that's sort of expected. Um, and so, of course, we're taking this sort of middle stance, but it, it kind of depends, and trying to spell out ways in which it, it depends on your, whatever, your, your theoretical assumptions. I think I heard from Jeremy, from you, Jeremy, that you're kind of sympathetic to that. It sort of depends view, rather yes. than coming down on one or the other. Yes, and in in, yeah. in some ways that was well, that's that was good. So we've had all three possible reactions. Yeah. Now, I mean, now. it was sort of signaled. It was sort of signaled by your slides, early slides, very helpfully italicizing quantum in one slide and gravity in the other. Right. Right. Yeah. Is it really a witness of quantum or is it really a witness of, you know? So, yeah. you know, anyway, sorry, thank you very much. That's sorry, yeah. helpful to me. Yeah. yeah. I thought you might like the reasonable people can disagree kind of line as well. I've certainly heard you give that in sort of other cases. <laughs> All right. But there was, um, so, but sorry, now I wanted to kind of answer the, um, yeah. Oh, oh, about the witness as a weasel word. And yeah. I, I don't know if other people were looking. I was looking to Mike while you were saying this, and he was kind of laughing there because, yeah. I mean, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, that word witness and oh, what yeah. it really means here. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, yeah, no, of course. I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, 
for a philosophical analysis, that seems like the real key issue is, what do we really mean by witness here? It's yeah. so unclear in what's sort of been said, and it's not clear to us, I think, that saying this is what everybody should mean is, is actually going to be helpful. So actually in the paper, we really kind of explicitly just kind of punt on, on this question. We spent a very long time sort of going through um, different senses we could think of of witnessing, because I think there is a, you know, you could imagine a witness where it's not really providing evidence, right? I mean, you know, I know this thing happened, you know, on the news. I just want to hear it. I just want a first person account of it, right? You know, yes, yes. yes. If we have a witness like that in the news, it's not like we doubt that it happened. We just want to know what it was like. And so there's that kind of witness as well. And we tried, we went through sort of legal dictionaries of the different kinds of witnesses to see if they were providing kind of useful. Met yeah. yeah. So I think that's all I can really sort of say here is, yeah, I, 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 I do agree with that, but we tried quite hard to do some useful work with, you know, work with it and some kind of indirect observation, you know, there is a sense here in which, you know, you know, with the theorem, there's a sense in which you could say it, it is a dependency here, you know, without, you know, you know, sine qua non kind of here, you know, if it wasn't quantum, I wouldn't be getting it. But there's other notions kind of in, I think, in play and it, yeah, saying much more than that is, is was hard, but I think I agree with the things yeah, you were saying right. as well. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next in line, we have uh, Yuliush. Thanks for the great talk, Nick. Uh, it's, Hi, Julius. It's, hey, uh, it's, it's a very good <coughs> topic. And I'm just, since you, since you look at this and you sort of know the literature and talk to people, I guess I'm a bit uncertain about why is it legit, or I, I guess I, 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 I don't say that it's not legit to work in like some sort of like a linearized limit, but of course, ultimately at some point, the, um, I guess not in the Newton, not in like Newtonian quantum gravity case, because that I expect will be a linear theory, because Newtonian theory is linear and quantum mechanics is linear, I guess. I'm not sure if that's a good argument, but I'm concerned about whether and when some sort of nonlinearity may start to play a role in this whole story, if that makes sense. So I'm, I'm thinking, of course, from a GR perspective, that's a nonlinear theory. So a lot of these things like superpositions and so on are like one would need to provide additional justifications. I guess this is some sort of regime which is linear, but I do we have a good understanding why is this linear and when it stops to become linear? Do you do you know if there's like some so, sort of control or explanation why I should not be worried about nonlinear effects in gravity in general in this sort of context? So. <clears throat> It's not really just, a question I, yeah. about your talk, but the sort of general question about the theory, right, I guess. Right. Yeah. Uh. So let me just say one thing that I actually probably meant to emphasize while I was talking, but I was going a bit quickly because I was getting worried about, about time. So, you know, in the, um, I will, and I'll put it up. <clears throat> so in the, the tripartite model, right? Um, <clears throat> It's true we're using GR to get this metric. And well, I, I, I guess the text emphasized it even if I didn't. Here I do have a superposition of gravity, but what I don't, I don't mean there a, a superposition, like a classical superposition of classical gravitational fields. Because of course, you know, GR is nonlinear. And so that won't be a solution, you know, that generally won't be a solution. And I think, it, okay. <clears throat> What I mean, I do mean a quantum superposition so that it's, yeah, I mean, it's just a superposition of two quantum, you know, quantum states of, of geometry. Okay, so just as, you know, just like a spatial superposition, a superposition of left and right, it's a superposition in that sense. I'm not adding the two classical fields. I have a vector in the Hilbert space that's a, you know, that's a superposition of those two quantum states. Does that bear on your question 
just before I go on or? Yeah, 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 okay? it does, it does. I'm, I'm just <clears throat> parsing it, yeah. Uh, so, so obviously in the Newtonian case, so one way of taking your question was, you know, go back to the Newtonian case. I know it's a bit annoying when people flash around their slides during questions, but it's good to have that up again. It's helpful for me, so. <laughs> Right, so in this case, you know, we're linearizing, now we're linearizing GR in the sense that we'll pick a background um, and then we'll just look for the sort of linear perturbations to that. And that's when we get to, to this description. So the dots, the dots in, you know, over here represent sort of nonlinear perturbations of Minkowski space time. But this is sort of standard, yeah, just taking the, uh, yeah, uh, assuming you're kind of linearizing the equations around Minkowski space time. You know, and that's justified in the usual way, right? It's pretty, space is pretty flat. And in fact, when we do this, we get the Newtonian potential. So we know we're really doing the right, you know, this is a good approximation here. Sure, sure. And people, so people who think about those experiments, do they think that like this basically we've kind of stopped at those dots where we have nonlinear terms and those? Yeah, yeah. Drop, I mean, or, so th is this the regime that they imagine they will be able to probe at some point or do they only think of like linear, this sort of like linear regime of right, right. some kinds? And if so, do they kind of isolate like some sort of scales or parameters that would correspond to like, so like, you know, if we if we throw enough money of them, will they, <laughs> and when, you know, I, I, I meant for like a physical regime, I guess, uh, not the fiscal regime, but. Uh, yeah. And it's so, so what those are. <laughs> well, look, I mean, clearly we're in this regime, right? I mean, these things have a much weaker gravitational field than the Earth, right? And this sure. regime works fine for, I mean, you know, sure, you know, sure. As Wallace likes to remind us repeatedly, right? If you're if you, when you're using your GPS, you have to worry about you know, more than just the Newtonian potential. But mm -hmm. um, clearly, that we're, this is the regime where we're, yeah. we're okay. I mean, if we can get the right, yeah, okay. So that that's there's no problem with that. Um, second, you know, insofar as our questions are involved about witnessing the quantum nature of gravity, forget the nonlinear terms. It's these terms I'd like to see having an effect. Mm -hmm. Right, the linear, you know, the linear but not gauge constraint terms. Those are the ones that one wants to one wants to get a handle on. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's even a step before what you're sort of thinking about. Um, but yeah, so, all right, maybe I will throw the final slide up, although I'm not gonna talk through the whole thing. Um, now, damn it. Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> but one of the things I would, yeah, I would certainly say one of the motivations for doing these experiments is um, sort of a general desire to get better control over the reg over regimes in which the quantum and gravity are interacting, regardless of whether you think there's a witness here or not. And so, you know, we'd refer back to sort of earlier experiments. So in the 1970s, people, these cow experiments, that's the authors, they didn't involve cows, right? They involved them. Um, uh, neutrons, so they had good sources of neutrons, and they realized they could actually observe. You could split a neutron beam into two parts and recombine it, and and if you did it vertically, because the the two um, legs of the experiment had passed through different um, gravitational potentials, you would actually pick up an interference term, and that was observed back in the seventies. So that's different from the experiments I was describing because the source of the gravity is itself not in a superposition. It's just classical, um, you know, it's just the earth. So there's nothing, there's no, there's no kind of tripartite system to kind of sort of try here. Um, so you, and you just get interference. Um, I would see this as, you know, we would see this sort of as another step. And okay, again, I'll, I'll give sort of a nod to, to Mike for pushing this line as a sort of step in that, sort of in that tradition of, trying to get better control. And yeah, exactly, you know, part of the reason is, you know, I'm sort of channeling Ian hacking kind of ideas here. In fact, part an important part of science is actually making theoretical ideas, you know, theoretical 
constructs real in the laboratory. But yes, to say yes to your question, you know, this is how science works. There's sort of a step of building better and better technologies to try to get to, um, to get further along. Ah, what we had in mind was, you know, reaching, you know, maybe ultimately reaching probes that would actually distinguish between even more fundamental physics. So that might actually get distinctions between string theory and loop quantum gravity. And maybe that does need the sort of even higher order effects. But, you know, that's hundreds, thousands of years in the future or something rather than, you know, a decade, I, I would guess. Sure. No, thank you. That's very helpful. I just, I guess I wanted to have a clearer <laughs> picture, but what of this I should be properly excited and uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to Henrique. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, I, I'm just a little bit confused about this, these statements that is the gauge part and the uh, gravitational part, what would be the analogous in the electrodynamics, electromagnetism case? Uh, are you saying that these are, let's say solutions, different solutions to the Gauss constraint or they're just the Columbic part uh, of the potential? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that. So I'm going to say mostly yes to what you're saying, except I'm not, you know, we were ultimately arguing against that thing rather than endorsing that thing, and certainly in a certain way. So there's a kind of line of thought, and I think the proponents of this line of thought would apply it both to electromagnetism and to gravity. So, you know, you take your, you take your, your classical action and, you know, necessary linearize, um, gauge fix. You know, what you find it at that point is you've broken it into a part that um, represents the gauge constraint, you know, a field. So in the in, right, exactly the Gauss constraint. So you would end up just with the electrostatic potential. And then just as we had other terms for, you know, um, interactions of the perturbations with the with 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 matter, you'd have terms for interactions of electromag you know, electromagnetic perturbations with um, with um, whatever the matter fields in the same way, so the charge distribution, I guess. And you would apply the same kind of analogy. You would say that, and then the lingo is just, this is the gauge term. The potential is just, is the gauge term that comes from the gauge constraint. And then there are these other parts that are describing dynamically the perturbations. And those are in the lingo, the true degrees of freedom. So well, that, I would that's say the formal the story, and then what freedom. we're pushing back on against is reading, don't read that kind of literally, you know, it would be a mistake to say, you know, just as it would be a mistake to say, you know, as, a, as we said, all the physics, all the gravity is in the, you know, the perturbations and none is in the gauge part, and I would say the same thing about electromagnetism. You know, of course, even though it's gauge, the electrostatic potential is still real, it still has real electromagnetic you know, physics in it. Okay, thanks. Is that okay? So it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's something to... You know, it was maybe, about. I was doing the, you know, doing the thing of sort of setting up a view so that I could reject it later. Uh, maybe Mike wants to jump in here because there is work, you know, I think there is, it, that just the distinction between the true degrees of freedom and the and the gauge part. It does some kind. It can do some work. It might do the work of saying, "Look, and this is what I had." Yeah. I think this last point. Yeah, this point that I've just made here. You still might come back and say, "Look, it's still just a gauge constraint. Yeah, it's physics. There's real gravity. You know, it's it's really part of you know, part of the gravitational field." But what I'm resisting now is the idea that when I when I idealize my underlying physics, I should go for the tripartite model. One might find this motivating as saying, "You know, of course there's real physics there, but I shouldn't really because it's just a gauge constraint. 
it's not a sub it's not a mediating subsystem it's not that's the wrong way to think about it i see so someone might try to you know it's not irrelevant that it's a, you know it's coming from a gauge constraint uh yeah I, I would echo that i mean i'm not sure that i'm committed to this personally but the language that comes to my mind is uh, okay we're all going to agree that the gravitational the field in some sense but the constraint part of that field is not the intermediating sense of field so it's not fieldy in the relevant sense for throwing in a third subsystem uh, because constraint is somehow sort of the strongest version of law it's it's global and it's all at once so it's not um in any sense you know transmitting effects from one part of that global thing to another part and so it's not the fieldy part of field even if it's a part of the field right so it's not propagating for example in uh, yeah well just to uh anticipate a a line of reasoning which is not necessarily where you'd be going but some might it's, it's not the propagating part true it is moreover not entirely right to call it the action at a distance part which is what some people quickly do because action at a distance still makes us think about uh, communicative uh, effects, even if they're instantaneous. This uh, constraint is something on this line of thinking, even more global than that. I don't know about this last part, but I think in general, I agree with you. If you want to voice your concerns, I think we will, we have a time. No, I just don't know what is more global than action at a distance. Uh, you know, <laughs> in the sense that the constraint can be solved by something like a Poisson equation, for instance, in the electrostatic case, and you know that's an elliptic equation and it's global in the the sense that you seem to allude to. And yeah, that for me represents the, this, uh, let's say, synchronic part of the field. Um, yeah, and it, it, it also, in a, in a certain sense, embodies this, this idea of action at a distance. But uh, yeah, it's uh, um, right. So this might just be a semantic um, difference of um, in certain contexts, I've gotten worried that uh, the phrase action at a distance was leading to equivocal um, mm -hmm. views mm -hmm. as pertains to the um, justification for adding a third subsystem into the sort of tripartite model. Uh, because the idea of the tripartite is you have these two otherwise non-interacting material quantum systems, and now there's a third thing that does all of the intervening stuff. Mm -hmm. And action at a distance in the sense of an elliptic equation that you're thinking of doesn't seem to be an intermediary in the same intuitive sense as we would um, maybe think back in the 1700s pre sort of understanding um, Newtonian gravity field theoretically. Uh, it's right. still instantaneous, but there's a sense in which it's due to the uh, bodies. And so that's yeah. trying to hold apart action at a distance of maybe a loose term that has some equivocating connotations. Right. So I, I what I would say is the acid test to see if it's a gauge condition or not is uh, i mean if it's an effect that is non-physical is can you find a gauge condition such that the effect disappears and if you cannot then i would say it's physical and um if you can then i would say it's not physical it's not, cannot be, yeah. I think that for me, that is, is the, yeah, the acid test. Of distance. 
anyway. But I didn't think the question at this point was whether it was physical or not. But right. No, whether this was whether it's a subsystem. A, yeah, right. I was going back to the your original points. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, Nick, perhaps uh, you want to add something from your sixth slide? Uh... Sure, people have, um, I'll try and just go through this fairly, fairly quickly. You know, Julius kind of brought up some of these issues, so it shouldn't take too long. So, you know, we've set things up so far for this kind of question about, you know, whether it's a witness in what kind of sense, you know, such an experiment would be a witness and the issues in trying to, trying to choose, by Enrique, um, trying to choose how to model and sort of think about it. Um, but kind of wanna, wanna put that aside, mostly to ask another kind of question about, you know, what's the value of the experiment? Um, and partly this is, you know, you might be thinking, all right, well, if it's not going to witness the quantum nature of gravity, then you know, why get all, to the, all the time and trouble to um, actually perform the experiment? Um, I think one justification you will hear is the one everybody will um, agree on is, uh, sorry, the, the, the point that every, sorry, the one justification you will hear is one conclusion, is the conclusion that we, everyone agrees we really can you know, draw from this experiment that if we see entanglement, then semi-classical gravity, you know, as I explained, um, is ruled out from this scenario. So then we know it's really refuted as a fundamental theory. So that's one motivation you'll hear. And I think I sort of suspect in sort of public facing discussions of this, of the experiment, that's one, that is one motivation that will be, will be emphasized because it's a fairly straightforward one to, to hear. Um, but that's a kind of funny, that doesn't strike, that isn't really a, a sort of an adequate um, justification motivation for the experiment, because I think very few people, especially very few theorists, perhaps none, you know, quantum gravity theorists take that as a, really as a serious proposition that in fact, you know, the fundamental theory of gravity is semi-classical gravity. <clears throat> and indeed, you know, there's a page in Geilke experiment, if, if you know about that, which is supposed to already have kind of refuted that. So that seems like an inadequate motivation for the excitement about the experiment. I mean, maybe, you know, even though no one believes it, sci this is one of the case where scientists are going to apply their very high epistemic standards and say, we've really got to rule this out. Um, maybe. It's certainly not going to be motivated, as I said to Julius, you know, because we want to distinguish loop quantum gravity from, from string theory. It's not going to have anything like the resolution to do that. All these theories are going to reproduce basic, you know, if they're not reproducing, you know, the Newtonian potential in this case, then they're, they're probably, you know, they're, they're pretty much ruled out already. <clears throat> um, Okay, uh, of course, one might accept the EFT approach to GR, in which case one's committed to the tripartite model, or, you know, not have that strong commitment, but, you know, you're committed to at least to, you know, the idea that, it, that gravity is an in, a mediating subsystem, so that the um, premises of the, the, the theorems are, uh, the no-go theorems are, uh, are in place, and I can uh, conclude that the quantum nature of gravity is witnessed, so that the, gra the gravitational field must be in a superposition. So there's all those reasons that sort of go have to do with what we've talked about so far. But we also wanted to emphasize in the paper a second, very different direction of thinking about what's the value of the experiment. And it is one I mentioned to Julius when I was asking his question, answering his question. The first kinds of answers are very much to do with if you think the role of experiment is to, you know, is confirmation, is, to, you know, confirmation or refutation, the sort of, you know, that, that sort of old school way of thinking about um, experiment. 
Um, you know, but of course, you know, in the last decades, people have thought much, uh, you know, much more deeply and broadly about the nature of experiment, and realized there's more just to it to it than mere than just testing. There's also controlling new physical regimes, knowing how to do things in different regimes, different kinds of um, physics, not just sort of knowing, not just sort of theoretical knowledge. So as I mentioned, these experiments then would push behind experiments that already put together the quantum and gravity in a very nice way, the cow experiments that produce interference in neutron beams purely by their interaction with the, the Earth's gravitational field. Here it's a step further because the effect, the entanglement is produced um, by um, the gravitational field, not of, a, of, of bodies that are themselves in superposition. It's the grab cat's gravitational field that's relevant, not the classical object like the Earth's. So part of that, um, you know, being part of this control tradition is you know just to develop technology so for practical purposes in that sense um with an eye as julius was kind of probing to um producing uh future tests where we might be able to do um, have more sophisticated tests actually test between different theories of quantum gravity you know other kinds of experiments one might want to do <clears throat> but also as i mentioned i was you know pushing this sort of Ian Hacking entity realism line here as well. There is just a part of science where, you know, the way we know that about, you know, the way we think things are real is because we can actually control and make them in the laboratory. You know, this experiment will of course not go down the whole hacking line. It's not gonna produce some effect that can be used, can be sprayed or used to intervene in nature to produce other effects, but it's in that kind of direction where we're actually trying to build, you know, actually make something, produce something in the laboratory. So that was our kind of list of motivations, some of which have to do with the rest of the talk, um, but some of which importantly are really independent of that. So, yeah, okay. So thanks for the asking the question. Sorry, I got to, to okay. lay, lay that out. Thank you very much, Nick.